This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermal unit operations. We are still in the section on distillation and rectification and the topic of this uh, video is single stage batch distillation. Before we want to set up all the balances and solve that, let's first have some introductory comments again. We know this of course in principle already. We see again a batch distillation for vodka distillation. That should be the example. Uh, we have an alcoholic aqueous solution um, which is heated by a furnace that looks pretty much like the same we have seen for the alchemists in, in Alexandria, so that not, not too much has changed apparently in that context. The liquid in here, the water-alcohol mixture, is evaporated partially. The ethanol enriched vapor, it's, it's not really ethanol vapor, but it's an ethanol enriched vapor, is then passing through this condensation uh, equipment, condenser, and then it's uh, collected after it's liquefied, so to speak, um, in the second vessel. You see the count of current flow of the cooling water, so it's entering at the bottom, leaving at the top, and well, it's apparent what happens. I mentioned that already. So the vapor here is enriched in ethanol that is condensed and of course that means that also the liquid over here is enriched in uh, ethanol. One should nevertheless stress the point. It's partial evaporation that is important. It's not the complete evaporation because of course if you look at the balances so to speak, if you would evaporate all the liquid, condense it and collect it over here, the overall composition wouldn't have changed because everything you have evaporated here would end up over there and you wouldn't gain anything. Only by partial evaporation, that is, evaporating only a certain fraction of the liquid, condensing it and collecting it over here, you have a chance to enrich the light boiling component in the distillate that you collect over there. Okay, okay that's, I guess, most of the things that we can say on this diagram. I could discuss some more details, but I think that's suffices for the moment. Distillation is also, I also mentioned already in another context with pharmacies, and that is of course uh, for alcohol production as well to a certain extent. Alcohol uh, as a medical component, perhaps not directly to consume it directly, but with the alcohol you can then extract, for example, pharmaceutical components from plant material. So for that you need some high concentrated alcohol solution. You can obtain it like this with this distillation equipment, or you can use distillation directly to produce some other pharmaceutically active components by steam distillation, for example. We see in principle the same parts of the overall equipment. We see some furnace over here, some oven. We see our reboiler vessel over here. We see our tube that transfers the vapor from the reboiler to the cooling uh, uh, apparatus. And then in the end, of course, the distillate has been collected. So this works as well. So you still have different types of equipment uh, that you can use in order to produce distillate from some feed material. Now before we want to set up the balances, we first have to define, of course, those variables that you want to use to set up the balances. And this is spelled out in this diagram. Here we see, again, the reboiler, we see the liquid, and we see that we remove the distillate. Well, now the things have variable names, that is the liquid the amount of liquid is L, the concentration the, is described by Xi, and I should mention here that in the context of this lecture I will always refer to that as the amount of substance and that as the mole fraction. For the distillate we have the amount of substance of the distillate, it's D, and the mole fraction of the vapor which is Yi. I refers to the individual component, so that's the mole fraction of component I. 
If you have alcohol water, you have two components, so you have a Y1 and a Y2. They have to sum up to unity, as you know. Now, one should discuss that a little bit, because I always in this lecture refer to this as more fraction and uh, amount of substance. But in industry, very frequently, mass-based balances are being used. And one should say, the outcome, the formal shape of the balances is identical, so also the result is identical. So in principle, you can use here also the mass, and of course, then correspondingly, you would have to use the mass fraction over here, or weight fraction, as one calls that. Here is the same. If you do use mass over here, you have to ma use mass over there as well. Mass of distillate and mass fraction or weight fraction in the vapor. Of course, if you then want to combine uh, balances and equilibrium information, mesh equations, you remember, then you have to do that consistently as well. So in that case, you have to use the equilibrium information on a mass basis, that is the weight fraction in the liquid and the weight fraction in the vapor. They have to be set into some relation if you want to describe equilibrium. So you have to describe equilibrium on a mass basis as well. Otherwise, everything is identical if you regard it on a molar basis or on a mass basis. Balances don't care. The only thing which is very important, you have to do it consistently. So you choose once and then you have to stick with that. Because usually in chemical engineering thermodynamics, equilibrium information between X and Y is given on a molar basis or a mole fraction basis, because that's a more natural description if you want to have molecular thermodynamic models like the NRTL model or Uniquack models that you may know, or some equation of state um, that you use to describe the equilibrium between vapor and liquid. Because molar basis is the most natural thing, I stick to the molar description. You can do otherwise, or can imagine that otherwise, mass basis is possible as well. And as I said, the resulting balances are identical. The form is identical, you only have to redefine everything on a mass basis, and you have to do it consistently. Something else that is spelled out here is that the pressure is constant. That is the typical case for distillation. Uh, very frequently, actually, for distillation, the equipment is somewhere open to the environment so that the pressure is more or less the ambient pressure. That is so because that is the cheapest case. In that case, you don't have a pressure vessel. And as you know, if you have some vacuum over here or some higher pressure, larger than ambient, then of course the walls of that vessel would have to be thicker and that's more expensive. So the cheapest thing is actually to have really ambient pressure in here that will lead to the cheapest equipment cost. But you can do, of course, have a higher pressure or a lower pressure for some applications that is really required, but the most general case is that it's open to the environment. In any case, you usually keep the pressure in the distillation equipment constant. So that assuming that the pressure is constant is a proper assumption. Actually, one should say why this is so, why we have to assume something about that, and this point is relatively simple. This pressure defines, so to speak, the equilibrium. The equilibrium is now defined. If we say pressure is constant, then we know which equilibrium diagram to use later, or which equilibrium curve to use if you want to describe it mathematically. Okay. Something else is mentioned here. It says direct removal of the vapor, which refers actually to the control volume that we have to define for which we want to set up the balances. And this is shown here. This is the uh, control volume. It's properly defined. It should be a closed volume around everything, so to speak. You have to think of that in three dimensions, more or less. And it passes through, and that's the essential thing, exactly through the surface of the liquid. That is, any vapor that is being generated upon the distillation process leaves the control volume directly. So anything passing this control volume boundary is out of the control volume and has to be regarded in the balance, in setting up the balance as leaving the control volume. And what we want to say actually is that what is leaving here is more or less also what is leaving over there. And that means direct removal of the vapor. And actually that assumption 
means that we assume that the amount of substance in this vapor volume here is more or less negligible. And if you consider the, the different densities, and of course the vapor density is much less than the liquid density, which means that the amount of substance appears really more or less uh, negligible as compared to the liquid amount of substance. So that assumption is not that bad. And even if that would not really be fulfilled, I mean for setting up the balance, it still holds. What is leaving the balance is gone directly. So what we actually assume is that there is no mixing up here, because if the mixing would be up here, then we would have to take into account if this would be mixed, that there's something going on with equilibrium. We want to assume actually that the vapor that is produced from the liquid is more or less directly in equilibrium. And that is the case. We know that we have a boiling liquid and we assume that the liquid is ideally mixed. Then the vapor that is produced from such a liquid is more or less directly exactly in equilibrium. Actually, if you look at certain equilibrium equipment, so equipment with which you determine the equilibrium of the vapor liquid equilibrium of some liquid mixture, then there you have uh, the so called dynamic um, equipment and that directly produces vapor from a liquid and assumes there also it is assumed that the two phases are in equilibrium directly. So that can't be such a bad assumption also for this distillation process. So generally vapor being produced from a liquid is usually in equilibrium with that liquid. Okay, I, I think uh, having said that is so far enough. We have all the variables, the variables have names and we can set up the balances based on that. I've introduced the control volume and I've told you something about the assumptions that we make. So ideally mixed liquid, the vapor that is produced is in equilibrium with the liquid. Okay, so based on that we can in principle set up the balances. But before we want to do that, I would like to show you in a diagram how the distillation proceeds in principle. And of course, the appropriate equilibrium diagram is that for constant pressure. I mentioned that already. And if you plot that, it looks like this. So in this diagram also, the pressure is constant and we can plot it only for a binary mixture. Of course, in principle, you can set up uh, similar diagrams for ternary system. Then you would have a triangular diagram as a basis and something on top of that. But that you would not be able to evaluate quantitatively anymore. So binary mixture is, I think, more easy to visualize, so we stick with that. And it's also quite frequent application. If you do alcohol distillation, you have an alcohol water mixture, and that's just it. Plotted is the temperature versus the mole fraction of the liquid and the vapor, and you know that at low temperature, the uh, system is in the liquid state, whereas at high uh, temperature you are in the vapor state. In between you have the two-phase region, so when the liquid is boiling, the lower limit is, so to speak, when the liquid starts to boil, so that's the boiling point curve or just the boiling curve, and on the upper limit you have the dew point curve or dew curve, which means that if you come from the top and pass that line, then the first drops of liquid will be produced, whereas if you come from the bottom, the first in the past that line, the bubble point curve, then the first vapor bubbles would occur. And in between you have the two phase region, so there you have you, not, not a single phase is stable anymore, you will always have two phases. One should also mention that of course in equilibrium you know pressure and temperature have to be constant. So those points that relate to an equilibrium actually have to lie on a horizontal line because for a horizontal line the temperature is constant. So horizontal lines between the two curves connect those phases that are in equilibrium with, it, with each other. Now, having discussed that diagram so far, we can now look what happens if we want to describe distillation, a batch distillation in that diagram. Let's assume that we start out with the starting composition. The zero means that this is a starting composition. Let's assume that we have a liquid and that we evaporate or heat the liquid until it evaporates. So we heat up the liquid until we reach the boiling point curve. That's a usual way you do it. If you have some alcoholic mixture in your vessel, you heat it up until it starts boiling. 
then the first bubble that occurs will, of course, as mentioned before, as we have discussed before, be in equilibrium with that liquid. Equilibrium means that we have a horizontal line, a horizontal tie line, and that means that the vapor composition of the first bubble is somewhere over here. So the liquid is here, the vapor is there. That means, of course, that the vapor is enriched in component 1 because this y is has a higher value in of component 1 has a higher value than the x and usually the component 1 is that which is more volatile and that's of course also which is the case here because the boiling temperature is lower of component 1 pure component 1 is on on this axis whereas component 2 is on this axis so their mole fraction of component 1 is 0 which means it's the other components it's a heavy boiling component and there of course the boiling temperature is higher so also in this case as it is typical nomenclature the component 1 is being the light boiling component so you sort usually the components after their boiling point light boiling component is for the most light boiling component is component 1 and the heaviest boiling component is well component n since we have a binary mixture it's component 2 so the vapor is enriched in the light boiling component, which means, of course, that the liquid will get depleted of that light boiling component. So the mole fraction or the composition of that mixture in the liquid will move to the left, which means it will enrich in the heavy boiling component. It will be depleted in light boiling component. And since we still continue to add heat, we will stay on this boiling point curve. We keep the system in boiling situation, so we are continually evaporating something from the liquid, and so we stay with the liquid on this boiling point curve. At the same time, of course, uh, on the vapor side, it, we will always have equilibrium. So these two points, so if the liquid moves to the left, then the vapor will have to move to the left as well, because you always have equilibrium between the liquid and the vapor. So both points representing the momentary situation in the reboiler will be always connected by a horizontal tie line. We are always in equilibrium and we will be moving to the left and it will be moving upward, which means temperature is increasing. So upon the distillation process, temperature is continually increasing. Well, another question is, of course, where does the process stop? Can we say this based on this diagram? No, we cannot. Certain things, certain different cases can occur. It can, for example, happen that we move somewhat to the left and then we have this, uh, evaporated all the liquid at a certain point and the process stops. So we would be moving up somewhere and then the liquid would be gone. That is one case that is possible in principle. The other option is that we distill, distill, distill until we reach here the pure liquid state. Then vapor and liquid would be pure um, uh, not pure liquid state, but it would be pure heavy boiling component, and then liquid and vapor would be pure heavy boiling component. And we could distill then, could stop distillation more or less because the remainder of the liquid would be pure heavy boiling component. So that could be the case as well, that we distill off a certain fraction until we reach that point, and the remainder of the liquid is pure heavy boiling component. Second option. Of course, there's a third option, and that is that we move up here until we exactly reach that point, and that is the point when the last liquid drop will be uh, dist being evaporated. So there are three options, stopping before, being here, and still have liquid um, heavy boiling component, or the third option is that exactly it matches, the last drop will be exactly here, before that you will be somewhere in this diagram, inside this diagram. We are not able based on this diagram alone to decide which case really occurs. And that's why we have to set up the balances and we will do that in the next video. So thank you for this video and in the next video we will talk about setting up and solving the balances. I hope to I see you again then. Thank you.